Um, so our special guest today is Professor Simon Krishley. Welcome, Professor Krishley, and everyone else attending this discussion from different parts of the world. And uh, this is time to formally introduce Professor Krishley. Uh, Simon Krishley is Hans Jonas Professor at the New School for Social Research. His books include very little, almost nothing, which immensely helped me during my PhD days, actually. Um, oh. Infinitely Demanding, 2007. Uh, Book of Dead Philosophers, 2009. Uh, the Faith of the Faithless, 2012. Uh, he has also written a novella, Memory Theater, 2015. A book-length essay, Notes on Suicide, uh, on which this interview is primarily based. Uh, 2020 and studies of uh, David Bowie, uh, Football and Applied Degger, uh, Onassis 2020. More recent books are Tragedy, the Greeks and Us, 2019, and The Bald from Yale University Press, 2021. He was series moderator of the Stone uh, Philosophy column in the New York Times and the co-editor of three volumes connected to the series. Most recently, Question Everything, 2022. Uh, he's a member of the board of directors of the Onassis Foundation and also 50% of an obscure uh, musical combo called the Critchley Anam Simmons. Uh, a book called Mysticism will be published in 2024. It's such a pleasure to finally have you here on the screen, Professor Critchley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for agreeing to be a part of this interview. It was such a pleasant surprise. Um, so in our discussion today uh, on, uh, it's called On Suicide Making Sense of Endings, uh, we will try to address numerous intricacies and conjectures surrounding suicide. Uh, and for the participants, if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat box, uh, or you can just switch on your video and uh, we'll take them up uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, so the first question no. Professor Krishley, um, is Sorry. that you explicitly state in your book that suicide can't simply be an act of self-sovereignty or rational choice. Uh, so let us begin with the two most fundamental questions. How do you okay. define suicide? And when someone writes, I quit, what are they really quitting or abandoning? Okay, so let's go over that. How do we define suicide? Yes. And the second question was? Uh, if someone writes in the suicide note, I quit, what are they really quitting or abandoning? Right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. And... Um, and uh, let's. Uh, I, hope, I hope you thank you for joining us and all of that. Um, well, how do you find suicide? I mean, that's well, self slaughter, right? Self self slaughter. Um, and uh, I don't know um, how this would uh, figure in the languages that people speak in the um, on this this call, but. Part of the problem in um, a language like English is that we just have this word suicide that covers a range of phenomena. So, uh, so you can define suicide as self-slaughter, so there we are. But does that cover the range of behaviors that uh, by which, by means of which somebody would end their lives? Uh, no, it doesn't. So there's uh, a major point in... Um, my investigation into this question, um, which was done about 10 years ago, it's not, it's, it, this isn't new work. This is a uh, work I was doing around 2013, 2014, is to um, expand the vocabulary around the question of suicide so that we can have more words to talk about the phenomenon. And, uh, and the reasons for, I could go into why I felt the need to do that uh, a little more in a little more depth. But I think there's a conceptual inadequacy around the question of suicide that we have this one concept that covers a whole range of different phenomena. Um, for example, um, I mean, someone can somebody can choose to end their life um, if they're diagnosed with a, a, a terminal illness of, of some kind, and that might or might not be uh, illegal. It might or might not be the right thing to do, but that's not really the same. That concept also covers the behavior of a, a suicide bomber, as, as we call them, or the... Um, uh, the actions of a betrayed lover, uh, 
or uh, someone who acts out of a kind of mania, a kind of a sudden wild mania. And uh, so, so part of the problem here is we have this one concept which covers a whole range of phenomena. And that concept is one that, um, if you like, uh, it's a, yeah, it, 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 it arouses panicked responses. It arouses a kind of moral panic. And that moral panic, I don't think is helpful or illuminating. So the best way of dealing with that is by talking about it and trying to kind of enrich our vocabulary around self self slaughter or ending one's love ending one's life so so part of the question of the book is really about definitions right and i think there's a lot of um because the the question of suicide invites such a a panicked moral response we don't think clearly about the topic and i think we really need to think clearly about the topic or to, to try and think clearly about the topic and then if someone says uh i quit then um what well, well they they could do that you know um and there's a a chapter of the book uh which deals with suicide notes and the, the final words that people choose to leave and i think there are again something that needs to be taken seriously um, and thought about as a kind of literary genre. Um, I mean, again, we tend to get rather panicked and excited by suicide notes, but just to look at them, if you read a lot of them, you find certain patterns of uh, utterance. And it's usually, you know, it's something like I quit and um, it's your fault. You know, there's usually some uh, expression of, often often self-hatred self-loathing um and then some expression of love so you often find in these suicide notes expressions of ambivalence which are really really you know painful interesting and so the, the, so these you know the, the 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 book is you know an attempt to kind of try and clarify uh, our thinking about this question, the history of our thinking about this question, and to uh, enrich our vocabulary. That's really what I'm up to. Right. Uh, so how how far is it justified, according to you, to criminalize suicide religiously, uh, morally, or legally? Because we do it on all three grounds, I think. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, don't, I in the way I deal with questions like that is to, um, we have to look at things historically. I mean, it's, um, Questions of justification or non-justification are, in a sense, um, that's one thing. Uh, I'm more interested in the question of, um, in this issue, I mean, where does this prohibition against suicide come from? I mean, how does that how does that arise? And um, we imagine because we're historically uh, not not as well informed as we should be that there has always been um, a prohibition against suicide and the question of the justification of suicide or not has always been a question human beings have asked and that's not the case it's um so one of the things i do in the early part of the book is to look at the history of the prohibition against suicide and um one of the interesting things as is that if you look at just say the if you look at the abrahamic faiths um judaism christianity and, and islam there's nothing about suicide in the hebrew bible uh there's nothing about suicide in the new testament and there's one sutra i think in the quran about suicide so it's hardly a an important topic and and so the issue of the prohibition of suicide is something that develops uh, at least in um in the west to use a kind of too easy term it it it, it arises in the context of medieval christian theology and there's a there's a specific argument that i could go into so before we get into questions of justification we have to understand the history of the concept Right. So it, my, my point is that to uh, to think that 
suicide is justified or is not justified is really kind of it's not really thinking things through unless we have a a deeper historical understanding of the phenomenon and so what i'm trying to do in the book is to, to provide a way of understanding the phenomenon and to do so with empathy with with uh with some compassion and i could say some more about the history of the prohibition against suicide if you like but justification is um in a sense i don't really get into it in the book i think that the um it's uh it's it's not the it's not the question for me. It's a, it, I think the issues, the questions of rights around suicide and duties, I think is largely philosophically confused. And I try and un, unpick those arguments in the second part of the book. I think we could begin by trying to understand things historically. That would be a, that would be a start. I can say more about that if you like. Right. Uh, so also, which is very interesting, uh, you know, if you follow the trend. And so in our online exhibitionist subculture, we discuss mental health issues all the time. And I, I, I do agree that it is of utmost importance. However, there is, a, there is also some kind of fantasy linked with depression and suicide. For example, if you are not showing uh, or, or writing about suicidal tendencies, you will not be taken uh, too seriously. So it is what one needs to have, perhaps. Um, a case in point uh, could be uh, the youth's obsession with wolves drowning or, or plots head in the oven. I, I hear it all the time from my students, you know, fascinated by, you know, how Plot died. So more than her poetry, what is interesting is that she died like that. She committed suicide. So what is this obsession? I think it says uh, a good deal about how <laughs> we, could, we could become more interesting people if we weren't so obsessed about uh, someone's suicide. The problem with suicide is that you, you know, it becomes. Um, there's a book by Edouard Levé who I talk, I talk about in the um, in the book. That in many ways the problem with suicide is if you do decide to kill yourself, then that becomes the punctuation point through which your whole the whole sentence of your life is seen. And I think that is a problem. And I think with figures like say Sylvia Plath or Virginia Woolf, it, um, our kind of, I think our almost kind of pornographic interest in suicide uh, covers over the importance of their, of their work. So I think it's, it's something to, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a problem in that regard that, and in many ways, this book, be, this book began, um, with, uh, I guess, in around, well, it began in different ways, but one way it began was with the um, the reported suicide of um, the comedian actor Robin Williams, and then the the death, which was reported initially as suicide of the actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I was um, I was living in New York at, at the time, and I was. I, I, how people reacted to these things. Uh, and they felt a kind of, I don't know, a kind of outrage that it had happened at all. And uh, and, and an outrage which was then followed by a kind of moral panic. And I just don't think that's good. So I, what we can do as, you know, as, as, as scholars or as thinkers is to at least, you know, think through the phenomenon, think, think through the history of the phenomenon and think through the way in which we, talk about a phenomenon like suicide and to try and um i think address some of the deficiencies in the way in which we talk about this issue so i think that's that's my my main my main point i mean i'm not you know i <laughs> i'd rather people stuck around right i'd rather people were uh, stayed with us um in in life I think one should one should go on if one can, but it's important to understand the reasons why some people choose not to, or situations arise where that becomes impossible. I think you know, that that is um, something like a humane response to that. I think is a first step, and not a kind of um, you know uh, rubbernecking, not a kind of looking you know being obsessed with. Uh, you know, Virginia Woolf's death rather than looking, rather than reading, you know, to the lighthouse or her other work, you know, so that, that would be one thing I'd say. Right. Uh, so how much do you also, how much do you, do you think 
our, our corporate slavery induced work culture, you know, job losses and companies encroachment upon personal time and algorithmic predictions are responsible for the ever increasing rates of suicide. It's, it's, it's something which, which is on the epidemic level. I think it's, it, it keeps on uh, increasing. Well, let's unpack that question a bit. Let's unpack that question. Give that to me again, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll try and answer it properly. So, you began with corporate slavery. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, then uh, the job losses. Mm -hmm. uh, then the company's encroachment upon personal time. Yep. You know, and and also this algorithmic predictions. You 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 are already given what you want to search for. You know, Google predicts for you. You know, you're on Facebook, and it already shows you that you would be needing this. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay, let me say, let me try and say a, a few things here. The, um, if you look at suicide coldly and um, sociologically, if you like, you look at it, you know, at, at a certain distance, and um, it's a, it, it's a hard phenomenon to to make sense of. Um, and but the patterns of um, the patterns of suicide, the suicide rates in the in the places where we do have reliable statistics, and also a lot of places do not have reliable statistics. So, for example, almost certainly the highest suicide rate in um, Russia has a very high suicide rate, but there are no statistics. So, um, you know, insofar as we can make a judgment about uh, patterns over time, there are some there are some strange variations. And, uh, and then if we think about things like uh, a loss of a job, or uh, an external factor that enters into, uh, a, a, you know, let's say something like depression, um, mood disorder. Sure, uh, that that can have that can have an effect. And um, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, if you look at say the last couple of hundred years, insofar as you can find the the uh, statistics and the uh, information that would back that up. You find, a, you know, a, for most of that period, uh, suicide rates are, they're variable, but not hugely variable. There are cultural variations, um, which are hard to explain. You know, for example, you know, Hungary has a higher suicide rate than Austria. Um, although culturally there are, you know, many factors they have in common and people like to think about climate in relation to suicide, that doesn't seem to have much, really much basis. So suicide rates are in, in an odd, oh, this is a, this is a, it might sound like an upsetting way of putting it, uh, in, in a sense, stable, right? There, there's a relative stability. There's, um, there's, a, there's a gender basis to suicide, um, a, a suicide attempts and, uh, uh, you know, as it were, completed suicides, as people say. Uh, women are three to four times more likely to attempt suicide than men. Men are three to four, four times more likely to achieve suicide uh, than women, things like that. And so there are these variations and these patterns, which uh, we have quite a lot of data. And um, in a sense, uh, we can look at those patterns quite coldly. And then uh, the the really the really disturbing question, which I think is um, behind what you what you what you've said, is that um, uh, has anything really changed with suicide in 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 recent recent time? And um, I think the the big question here is about the relationship between. Um, let's say what's called in the literature PSMU, passive social media usage and um, um, mood disorder, depression, suicidal ideation and, and suicide. Um, is, there, is there some kind of correlation between um, rates of 
everything from mood disorder to suicide and you know let's say what you were talking about the algorithms or you know the the fact of smartphone market saturation has have things changed and the the you know the research would seem to indicate that yes things things have changed and uh, that's something that really we need to um we need to think seriously about and there needs to be i think government uh, policy changes on which would have quite significant um effects i think if, if they were taken seriously so it, it would appear so if we if we say uh if we take the period from around 2012 to where we are now what is it 2023 uh and we say that in around 2012 there is um uh smartphone market saturation at least in um in let's say parts of the developed world and, and elsewhere uh is there um have people's behaviors changed as a consequence of that and the the early indications from the data and it's hard to you know it, it's hard to, to you know to, this is this is something which has been put together by um there are a couple of people uh, Jonathan Haidt at NYU and a woman called Jean Tvenge, uh, and they've been sort of putting together all the different bits of research that are going on elsewhere. So yes, there is that there does seem to be a correlation between increased suicide rates and social media use, and the effects of that seem to be more significant on uh, on on women than on men, and on young women than anybody else. So if there is a population which is particularly at risk from uh, what's going on in, say, relationship to social media use and uh, everything from mood disorder to, to suicidal ideation and suicide attempts, then um, we'd have to think really carefully about the effects on, on, on particularly on teenage, uh, teenage females. And then you know, something might need to be done about that. That might mean that uh, you know it's hardly great um, uh, advertising or marketing for for these uh, tech giants to know that these these organisations are actually um, driving a, a significant increase in suicide rates. But I think they are. So I think the you know, part of the problem is that these things, you know, the, these things that we we have, these smartphones, uh, have a pretty deleterious effect on. Uh, how we feel, and then what we do, and uh, and that's something that's just beginning to be properly understood, and uh, it needs to be acted on as a matter of urgency. Right. Uh, also, would you agree that 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 our paradoxical reactions surrounding suicide are primarily uh, due to this? That it is perhaps this one singular thing, which is of course taking our own life, that separates us from the animals. Uh, that that we are in control uh, of nothing else except this decision to end it all. So we are always so dangerously close to it, isn't it? And of course, take into consideration that animals do not know how to commit suicide. Well, we don't know that, right? I mean, we don't. Yeah. We don't. We, 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 if if a lion could talk, then we we could not understand it, as uh, as Wittgenstein said. So we don't know, and it's possible that in the case of. Um, you know, higher primates or, you know, um, I have no difficulty in imagining an octopus killing itself. I mean, I've read some studies of octopuses in the last 10 years, and, you know, that's a different branch of the evolutionary tree. They have extremely, extremely high level of intelligence. They have very short lives. And is, is suicide uniquely human? Uh, maybe. You know, but maybe not. So I'm not so certain about that. But certainly, when when it comes to human beings, yeah, we have we have that power in our hands. And I think that's important to to remember, to understand that, and to uh, to act to act carefully and responsibly with that. But the if we're thinking about something like uh, freedom. Uh, what freedom do we really have? Then, yes, we do have the freedom to um, choose whether to to live or to 
cease to live, right? And I think that's that's the fundamental question. And this is, you know, in the book, I, you know, I, I, I um, in the last part of the book, I um, use a lot of people like Albert Camus and uh, Jean Améry and and others to to explore this question. But remember what Camus says in the Myth of Sisyphus that the only philosophical question. The first philosophical question, the only philosophical question is whether I choose to live or not, right? So the question of suicide is the philosophical question. And that's something which is dependent on us and how we how we act and how we how we think about uh, ourselves and how we face up to that. So there are all sorts of ways of, you know, it's a very complicated phenomenon, but I uh, the book really focuses, it focuses, the book really deals with this issue of of how we think about suicide as a free act and how we try and understand suicide as as a free act and we don't fall into forms of moral panic or blaming or shaming right it's uh, it's it's a power which lies with us right right um, so, so also the act of suicide is usually accompanied by an apologia, you know, uh, that this happened either due to one's debilitating mental condition or it's a condemnation of acting freely. So how do you propose, uh, as a philosopher, as a, as, a, as a theorist, how do you propose to create a non-taboo space where this act could be discussed without succumbing to any ethical or judgmental inconsistencies? Uh, slowly, slowly. I mean, it's... So, um... so, so what I'm trying to say is, it's always we judge suicide as a, you know, as an act which, uh, you know, is res responsible due to someone's, uh, you know, debilitating mental condition. Uh, we, we we condemn someone for acting freely. So mm -hmm. what I'm asking is, as a as a as a theorist, as a philosopher, or as a practitioner, uh, how do you propose to create a non-taboo space where this act of suicide can be can be discussed without uh, you know, succumbing to any ethical or judgmental inconsistencies. Well, I mean, it means something like this would be, you know, here's Nick, who would be an example of it. We we can talk about this in a a public context, insofar as this is a public context. So I think the more these questions are discussed in, you know, by more people, then the better. I think it, it, it's when when issues of when suicide becomes um, something. Um, um, something obscene, something you know, hidden away, something we um, uh, we can't really acknowledge. We don't know how to think through. I think that's a very, very poor state of affairs. So I think the first thing we can, I think this is a long, this is this is a long, um, a long battle. It's um, it, and it's a question of trying to find um, a language uh, where we can discuss the ending of human life, self-slaughter, whatever we want to call it, suicide, in a way that is, um, uh, that, that makes sense and where we begin to, we begin to understand it. Now, I think that is happening in, in um, some places that I'm aware of. I think the, the, the taboo around suicide is, is changing, right? I don't think it has changed yet, but it is changing. And I think there is, um, I mean, there's some, you know, on, on I think at, at one level, there is some modest reason for optimism, right? So that we are talking about this question and we're thinking about uh, how it is, how it unfolded historically. And we're thinking about in particular, um, how legal frameworks developed uh, that made suicide uh, illegal, for example. How did that happen? And that happened in in the West through um, the effects of the effects of medieval Christian theology on the framing of of law, uh, of the framing of law in the, in the in the medieval period, in particular in the early modern in the early modern period. And the fact is that many people still live within such legal frameworks and within those frameworks suicide is either illegal or is still effectively criminalized and where the medical profession um, 
are, you know, obliged to keep people alive in all circumstances. And we know that, you know, we know in every hospital in the world that uh, every day um, people are being people are being allowed to die, right? For for reasons that they that, that are humane, but actually uh, contravene, you know, the basis of medical ethics. So I think we need to um, to play a long game here, and uh, and I think I don't feel optimistic about many things. And I'm not. I don't really feel optimistic about the question of suicide, and you know where we are with, in particular, the effects of uh, smartphone technology on 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 human behaviour and and human reactions. But I do think that we're getting to a position where we can have a a slightly more mature and developed discussion of suicide. So I think it's right. better than it was twenty years ago or ten years ago. Right. So so we are, of course perpetually torn between uh, David Hume's uh, rationalization of suicide uh, as, as a legitimate and dignified act when life becomes a weight uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and Camus' relentless pursuance despite the absurdities of life. Therefore, ultimately, is the choice between self-care by killing oneself, that I, care, I, I so care about myself, so I kill myself, and uh, on the other hand, uh, life and living as a political act, uh, as part of our responsibility towards society. Uh, so what I'm trying to ask is, do, do you think that this obsession with the, this obsession with, um, you know, ending oneself or, you know, finally killing oneself, do you think mm -hmm. in a society which depends so much on, uh, you know, entangled and codependent entities, uh, do you think really suicide should be seen uh, as an act of, um, you know, uh, a, a kind of individual act, or is it an act of self-obsession and selfishness? It, it can be. Uh, it can be self-obsession and selfishness. It's. It's. It can be. Um, I mean, people can act uh, rationally in the most um, outrageously insensitive ways, right? And this is. Uh, so I think there's a, I mean, firstly, the, the book, um, at the end of the book, there is a, we republished David Hume's uh, essay on suicide, which I, I recommend to people out there as, as, a, as an incredibly level-headed and uh, helpful short essay, which just gets rid of a whole number of the, uh, Particularly the, the 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 metaphysical framework of of Christianity, um, insofar as it frames the the legal question of of is it justified to end one life ends one life end one's life does one have rights and duties with regard to suicide? I think, you know, I think it's um, in the second part of the book I try to dismantle the the talk of rights and duties in relation to suicide. I think we can just, we can, we can do better than that. Um, and I'm also suspicious of the, um, uh, the idea of, you know, if, if you like the libertarian argument for suicide, um, that I, yeah, insofar as I'm an individual, I have the freedom to, you know, rationally choose to end my life. Um, I, I think that, I think that gets that's a very confused idea of um, of self sovereignty. The idea that I'm as as it were, I have the the rational uh, transparency to understand and sovereignty over myself to to make a, a judgment in that regard. So I think that um, questions of rational choice with regard to suicide, I think you know, need to be moderated. So I think. Our obsession with suicide is uh, is part of the problem, and I think we need to um, uh, we need to calm down, uh, and we need to understand what's happening and treat what's happening uh, with empathy rather than with uh, panic and and rage, and to try and um, yeah to try and, to try and get a, a clear view of the phenomenon. And in many ways, the, the the book ends with a, you know, um, the book ends with a 
uh, a discussion of the Romanian uh, writer, uh, Choran, the French call him, Sioran, E.M. Uh, Choran. And um, he has a great refutation of suicide, which is a, a pessimist refutation of suicide. And he says that basically the problem with suicidal people is that they imagine that something will be changed by by their demise and that's the problem you know you're you know you're not that important you know get over it um think about other things and uh that's a nice response and so um, yeah so i think our uh in many ways our obsession with suicide betrays a certain naivety you know um there is a there is a kind of need to 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 grow up and own these things on the one hand on the other hand on the other hand i think um i mean where uh in the in in the book i in in the, in the first version of the book there's, there's, there are two versions of the book of a, a version that came out in 2014 2015 and then I did a new version in 2020 in the first version I I didn't include any sociological um data uh I I collected it I read it but I didn't think it, it just didn't work in the book I didn't want to kind of um frame it in terms of uh you know a current debate or suicide statistics uh in the world uh, so on and so forth but then in the preface um to the 2020 book i really i i i changed my mind and uh because i was so alarmed by the um the the way in which smartphone technology was having an effect on people's mental health and the effects that that was seeming to have on uh suicidal practices and and trying to, and we need to begin to think that through you know, there's a there's a kind of I mean something. Let's face it. I mean, something has um, significantly changed in um, in human behavior in the last ten years, and uh, and I didn't grow up with that. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate en enough to to grow into a mature human being before. Uh, before smartphones and then but then i think that raises the question of what would the what would the counter example be what would it be to grow up when this was uh this digital reality was one's reality and one is in a situation of being um uh you know what virginia heffernan who writes on the internet very well calls uh hyper arousal the hyper arousal of the internet and the hyperlexia like the fact that we're continually reading and continually kind of exciting ourselves in relationship to um to social media and how that has an effect on our mood our behavior and we need to think that through but i mean this is but this is you know this is only it's hard to imagine this is only the last 10 years it, it's really very new and uh that has been obviously those issues have been focused uh around the the pandemic as well so yeah, we we um on the one hand, so on the one hand, I'm slightly optimistic when it comes to discussions of suicide. I think that we are in a better place than we were 15 years ago in having a kind of grown-up uh sympathetic discussion of these th these issues. And, not, and on the other hand, the actual situation, the lived situation, let's say the, the digital reality that people inhabit is uh is incredibly uh uh sad depressing and it invites uh you know it needs to be thought through and thought through quickly and uh things do need to be done right um so also could we could we say that uh except for perhaps euthanasia all kinds of suicide um uh, from that of a suicide bomber uh to a person killing themselves for for some kind of perverse revenge uh, are in fact ultimately connected to an idea of well-being or over narcissism, you know, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, I, I mean, if it's not some afterlife, it is definitely this that, uh, you know, since I cannot make sense of this world anymore, I'm better off dead than alive. So how does one commit the fatal error of combining death and happiness? Well, it's not, I don't think it's happiness. I think it's, it, it's kind of, you know, 
a desire to exit. It's a kind of desperate desire to to get out. And and um, uh, I mean, maybe there are some, you know, there are some. Well, there's a couple of things to, to mention. Firstly, I mean, um, I want to talk about suicide, homicide. I'm just making a note here. Um, I mean, narcissism um, is an important topic. Um, and remember when, what does narcissism mean? Narcissism, narcissism isn't just an obsession with the, the self, right? Narcissism is a splitting in the self that occurs when the self begins to observe itself, begins to look at itself from outside of itself. And that induces on the one hand, a kind of self-regard, but usually uh, a self-hatred. So if you think about uh, Freud's discussion of narcissism, which is, um, which I think is still brilliant, in, in narcissism there is a splitting of the self between uh, a self and then a self that observes that self and finds that self um, poor, uh, weak, ridiculous. And so the most extreme version of, uh, I mean, how that would work in in narcissism would work suicidally is that that splitting of the self can become so extreme that that uh, external self that's, uh, that's saying, you, know, you are a worthless piece of shit, you are a worthless piece of shit, eventually succeeds in uh, in squashing that, that self. But at least there is that, that splitting. I think here of, you know, Hamlet, Hamlet's soliloquies are, he's talking to himself, talking to the audience, talking to himself. Um, as, as wonderful examples of narcissism. So narcissism is the splitting of the self. So it's that, and what you find in um, in suicide notes is uh, are often extreme examples of such narcissistic splitting of the self. Um, so there's one very short suicide note, which I quote in the book, which is, you know, dear, dear, dear Betty, I hate you, love George. That's it. Dear Betty, I hate you, love George. And in that note, you've got hatred and love. Or think about, say, Kurt Cobain, right? The uh, Nirvana. If you read that suicide note, you can actually find a facsimile of that suicide note online. Uh, he's, uh, he's full of a narcissistic sense of um, how he's, how much he hates himself, how He's too moody, he's too difficult, and then it ends with his expressions of love. I love you, I love you, I love you. So what you find in, in the suicide note is often an expression of this ambivalence, which is, which is the trait of narcissism, the splitting of the self, the narcissistic splitting of the self. So there's that point. Um, I was going to talk about suicide, homicide, but maybe we should move on. I don't know. Right. So taking a cue from this, uh, uh, this fact that suicide is also homicide, uh, so the, and the self transforms into an object and the suicide note turns into uh, self-hate exhibitionism rather than self-expression. You know, do you, do you intend to say that, um, that, that uh, suicide is often an act of sadomasochism, where you punish the other by punishing yourself? Yeah, I mean, suicide is, to that extent, is the... Um... You know, is the <laughs> the last word in sadomasochism insofar yeah. as the self that is um, the self that's punished. Uh, the self is punished by by yourself. You are punishing yourself. The the kind of delusion that ties that together is that you have sovereignty over yourself to become, you know, both the um, both the judge and the jury. Both the you know. So I, I think it's um. Yeah, you you can see it in those terms. It's um, I think it's um, you know I think these things have to be understood. I don't think I'm not recommending anything here. And I found that I mean I stopped um, I stopped talking publicly about suicide uh, a number of years ago because I was I became worried about the the way in which the question, um, the kind of the strange attractive energy of the question, 
of suicide. I think it gets people wound up, and uh, you, uh, you know, and and I, I found that, and I I feel that way now as well. I felt uh, fraudulent in um, addressing the question. I got quite good at talking about it, but the better I got at talking about it, the less um, the less happy I was with myself the way I was talking about it. So I think there is a, there is a uh, it, it is a because it's such an attractive question. It pulls us in, right? I think it has to be dealt with um, very kind of soberly, very very calmly um and I thought about very carefully and and I think the thing the thing to be uh the thing to be avoided is this is this is this overreaction and, and moral panic um uh I think that, that's the worst thing now on um suicide homicide there is um I mean I kind of um in the book I talk about um I talk a little about uh suicide homicide and there is a you could say well this has always been the case this is perhaps what you know what warriors have done in in war situations they you know they throw themselves into into battle in order to be killed there is a kind of suicide homicide aspect to that but I think the you know the phenomenon of the uh the suicide bomber uh or the um, the phenomenon of what what's called in the, in the United States suicide by cop, right? So that you would you would put yourself into a situation where you knew you were going to be shot by the police, and indeed you are shot by the police because the American police are very pleased to yeah. to shoot everybody. And so um, so there is that, and I think the the idea that that suicide I think this is perhaps a kind of magnification of the narcissism of suicide where you know my death uh is a way of taking everybody else out at the same time i think that has to be understood it has to be comprehended and thought through and um you know there's a lot of uh examples of um of shooters shooting school shootings uh i discuss in the book uh this guy elliot roger who was uh who was very angry, uh, a life of you know, great privilege, but he was very angry with the way he was treated by women and then went out to kill as many people as he could, but filmed himself, uh, did actually two videos of himself and wrote a, a hundred page manifesto. Um, and then, so I analyze him in the book, but then he became, he became one of the figureheads of what's called the incel movement, the involuntary celibate uh, movement in the United States, and um, it's pretty weird, pretty weird stuff. So, but yeah, I think suicide has to be understood and um, empathetically, and not judged. And uh, this is a, a way of doing that. Right, but but also something which bothers me also this this morbid uh, discourse around death. You know that death is something evil or negative, or it is this divine abnormal space. Uh, and the individual might choose it as an opposition uh, to or vengeance against the normal ordinariness of life. So what I'm trying to ask is why choose death where you can just, you know, uh, get on a train or on a plane and just disappear, you know, uh, get out of the society which torments you. Know? I mean, I mean, why choose a particular thing? This is this amazing thing that, that death is. I'd rather people didn't. I mean, I'd rather they, they you know, um, they didn't. Uh, I think there is a there, it, to some extent it's it's something one goes through you know when you're a a teenager or an adolescent there is this kind of um uh morbid obsession with death uh, often a, a a strong interest in suicidal issues you know puberty instability growing up all of that so I'm not judging that um but yeah, I mean, you can, the, the, in the, the moral of the book, insofar as there is a moral, the moral is, you know, you should go on, you should continue, and you should continue with perhaps a slightly comic pessimism, right, about uh, the possibilities of existence, and don't rate yourself too, too highly. But, um, so I think the, the, the morbid obsession with death, I think is part of the problem.
Yeah. So I agree with you. Right. And also, uh, you know, following, following the last question, uh, how do you read homicide uh, before suicide with reference to uh, school shootings in the US? Uh, you know, the first I'll kill and then I'll kill myself. Uh, yeah. but simultaneously, how to judge suicidality when we consider race, ethnicity, gender, class, and caste differences, you know, that suicide cannot be a, you know, a straight, a linear thing because it keeps on, it has curves, right? It has what? It has curves, right? It, 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 it has those curves, you know, according to race, class, gender, ethnicity. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, it's not, um, yeah, it does. And, and the case of, um, I mean, suicide, homicide is, I think you need a, you know, you need a, you need a little bit of psychoanalysis and a little bit of uh, understanding to, if you think about the, say, the Sandy Hook shootings and these, often these uh, school shootings follow a similar pattern. Um, the Sandy Hook shooting, the first victim was uh, uh, the young man's mother. And then he goes and kills 27 kids at the school where his mother worked part of the time, and then he kills himself. So what's going on there? And um, what is, you know, how do we... So I think I think we get nowhere... The, the, point, the point of my book is that we get nowhere with our reactions, right? Our reactions are just reactions. And uh, we react to something, we're outraged by it, and we expect something to be done immediately. And we need to think, we need to calm down and think things through and actually think about, if, if, if we're actually compelled by this question of you know, whether suicide should be uh, in some, some circumstances allowed, um, say, uh, to think about what it would take to um, make that an actual public issue that people could, uh, people could act on, could, could vote on perhaps, um, and it could try, and we could try in that way to remove the the stigma around suicide. Uh, there's that, and then there's another question about, you know, wouldn't it be better if we had five or six different concepts to cover this range of behaviours? Because this one concept, suicide, just doesn't cover the whole range. It's not adequate. We need uh, a whole bundle of concepts. We can't say that. You know, suicide in the case of uh, an impulsive and sudden act, I throw myself out the window, is the same as suicide out of revenge for being, say, uh, a cheated lover or whatever it might might be, or or the same thing as as the suicide, the ending of someone's life who is has a a terminal illness, and um, and so on and so forth. These are different different phenomena that need different concepts. So. Yeah, so that that's what I'd say. But I'm I'm to to some extent I like I said before I'm fairly uh, I'm more optimistic than I was about suicide. I think the sense that there's more discussion of it. It's now seen as more of an issue, and uh, and I think the you know the suicide I think that's going to be that's going to become more of an issue in the next year or two. I was just checking on the. Uh, Center for Disease, the CDC uh, website today in preparation for this this talk, and the the latest statistics um, available in the United States are from 2020, and they show a slight reduction in the suicide rate, which itself is interesting that the pandemic uh, led to a slight reduction in the suicide rate. But that's consistent with depression, actually. The depressed people, when other people are depressed, say during a pandemic, tend to hang on and think, well, things aren't so bad. The most popular time for suicide is always the spring. That's the season for suicide. And the most popular day of the week for suicide is Monday, when people get back to work. So um, the effects of, say, the pandemic are going to be seen when statistics are published in the next couple of years, and we'll see um, the increase. And there will be, a, I think, a pretty significant increase in the... And then the question in relationship to that is, has that increase in um, suicides, uh, can we show that that has uh, a correlation to social media usage? Uh, 
and in particular the gender effects of social media usage and if that can be shown then what on earth are governments going to do about that because uh it might be judged extremely dangerous to put smartphones in the hands of 15 year old boys or girls right so right um and, and this question is my personal favorite so uh, do you do you agree that we need to distinguish between let's say uh, suicide by a hardcore melancholic like uh, like edward leave uh, uh, and on the other hand, you have Jean Mary's defense of uh, suicide as an act of freedom in a concentration camp. You know, how do we differentiate between them? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, the, the Leve thing is just, you know, the um, it's just the oddity of someone who suddenly decides to kill themselves, you know, returning to, how does it happen in the book? It's someone that you know, they left a house to go and play tennis, <laughs> to play a tennis match. And um, the young man decides to go back to the house because he'd forgotten his tennis racket that was in the basement of the house. Goes back to the basement of the house. And instead of picking up the tennis racket, picks up a gun and shoots himself. And Leve is trying to make sense of you know, what did what happened there. I mean, Amery is kind of... Um, um, yeah, is is a more heroic. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I justify it, but I, I I put these, if you like, existential authors together, uh, together with Virginia Woolf. She she makes an appearance at the end, and um, to try and you know to expand our the our palette, our vocabulary for thinking about the question of suicide. The more examples we have, the better, right? Um, and literature is full of them, so. That would be a very good place to to start. Right. Uh, and also, don't you think there should be an entirely different register uh, for the prevention of suicide rather than, uh, you know, love your life or your country, community, family needs you or look at the endless possibilities before you. So if you if you if you do agree, what alternative do you propose? What needs to be one? I didn't hear the last words. So, so if you do agree that we need a different register altogether, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what alternative do you propose? Oh, I just propose. I propose, um, you know, understanding <laughs> and and the accumulation of uh, examples. That that's what I propose. I propose that we don't um, we we use philosophy negatively in order to show that the discourse on rights and duties around suicide is pretty deluded. We try and understand the phenomenon historically, how did the prohibition against suicide arise? And then to assemble as many examples as possible in order to bring as broad a range of color to this phenomenon as, uh, as we can. So, you know, I, I'm not aware of anybody else uh, taking suicide notes as seriously as I take them, but I think you know here is here is a new literary genre, right? Here or here is a, here is a genre of literature which needs to be entertained, taken seriously, and it's fascinating. And uh, why shouldn't there be a, a class on suicide notes? Uh, and I think that would help because that would give more examples, that would provide a richer language and vocabulary, right? So I think that the it's the, um, uh, you know, our culture on the one hand is is uh, a culture of based on the denial of death, as Ernst Becker argued a long time ago, and also with, a, as you were saying, a, a morbid obsession with death. And we need to get past that. And so one way of getting past that would be to think through suicide with lots and lots of examples. Right. Um, and my last question is, uh, there's a brilliant part uh, towards the end of your book where you uh, refer to the works of the Romanian philosopher and aphoristion E.M. Sioran, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Yep. Um, so I would like to quote the lines uh, you cite yeah. from Sioran. Um, and, the, and the lines are it's beautiful. So it says, only optimists commit suicide. The optimists mm -hmm. who, who can no longer be optimist, uh, the others having no reason to live, why should they have any to die? And mm -hmm. 
So instead of asking you a question here, I would request you to elaborate on the pessimist's embracing of life and your own suggestion of living in the birth of moments, which you so wonderfully end the book with. Right, it, it, it's a kind of, it's the, um, I mean, optimism is, the, optimism is the disease, right? Optimism is the virus. And, um, and uh, you know, what do you do with optimism? It's kind of, um, it's not going to go away. It's, um, it's generated by ignorance, you know, <laughs> in a sense that stupid people tend to be optimistic. And the, you know, and pessimism is uh, a way of dealing with that. Uh, it's a way of uh, wising up, if you like. But there's nothing uh, negative about that. So I, I see pessimism as uh, a position of a pessimism of of, of strength, of um, of good humour, um, of high spirits, and I see that as you know um, philosophically that would be consistent with someone like Nietzsche, right? So for Nietzsche, the great disaster of um, the great disaster of the last 3,000 years has been the, the triumph of optimism, firstly in the form of Socrates and secondarily in the form of Judeo-Christianity. And that's what we need to get, get beyond. To, um, and to see the, the, the cheerfulness and the uh, affirmativeness of pessimism, right? And so Sharan would be a kind of expression of that. And... Uh, and also funny, and yeah. So I think another another way of doing this would be to um, think about the way death and suicide figure in relationship to comedy, which is a very good way of thinking about all these questions. So yeah, how's that? Right, right. So the session is now open open for questions. Anyone who wants to ask, uh, we already have two questions. Uh, do I read them out? Officially, do I read them out? Uh, okay, it's on chat. Okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's in chat. That's right. What do you read them out, and then I can think about what to say? Um, I can, I can, I can only stay for another fifteen minutes or so because yeah, I've got. Yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. So we can take two or three questions. Yes. Uh, so I think this uh, Keshe Bansal is asking: uh, Could could the act of suicide be a vehicle of being rather than not being? And is then being different from living. So I think what he what he also means is that sometimes suicide is, uh, for example, in the case of Wolf or Plath, he says it's a vehicle of being uh, for an imagined self or utterance that could not have been possible, plausible in living. So can it also be an act of being? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. So that, that would be a kind of modest yes to that um because it, in that sense you know, particularly in the case of the, the marginalized or the subaltern yeah yeah i think it's a good point right um and the, and the next question is uh, by shomir uh, he asks how does one make sense of the lack of closure uh for the family friend the caretaker which comes with the lack of absence of a suicide what does it mean to not leave behind the assurance of language in that sense well, it's it's it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, the history of the suicide note, as you can tell, I'm very historically minded. I think um, the task of philosophy is to, you know, in a sense, is to wage war on abstraction and theory, and to try and uh, to be better informed historically. That's my general position. Now, suicide notes might have existed in antiquity. Um, to my knowledge, the suicide note really begins to appear in the 18th century um, in um, in England, and it surprisingly, but not surprisingly, it appears uh, amongst um, in the world of printers and artisans. Um, and there's there's been some a little work done on this. So suicide notes are also historically specific phenomena right the the idea that we expect a note with the suicide is is a modern um is a modern prejudice so um 
But the, the larger question, how does one make sense of the lack of closure? I think with difficulty, I think it just takes time, right? It's, um, I mean, how long does it take to get, you know, to come to terms with someone's death, uh, with someone that one loves or one cares for? And you didn't get to say the thing that you meant to say before they died, or you weren't there when they died, or whatever it might be. Um, I think part of it is also learning to, you know, learn to forgive yourself. Um, it's hard. And uh, let's say the last question, shall we? Right. Uh, the last question from Shatabdi. Uh, she, it's a two-part question. She says, do you think active euthanasia or uh, physician-assisted suicide takes away autonomy? An agency from an individual's hands. That's the first part of the question. And the second part is speaking of autonomy, do you think mass suicides with cultist intervention or revolution like the Jonestown massacre uh, takes away individual control? Can these mass suicides be seen as homicidal self immolation? Yeah, on the last bit, yes, yes. I talk about Jonestown in the book. Yeah, I talk about Jonestown very briefly. So, yes, and um, really, really weird stuff really strange and um and you know the actual and also there's actually a recording of that um the last sermon by whatever his name was in jonestown well from jones and um the the first question i think is really difficult um really difficult question i think that um I think that you know um, people should be allowed to, in, in in as far as possible, to be in control of their their death and how their death is is handled. Uh, I've I've experienced, and I'm sure other people here have experienced uh, the opposite case where you you have somebody that um, would quite like to leave their life and they're being artificially kept alive or you're engaged in this weird dance with um, morphine where someone is being kept alive and killed at the same time. I think um, I think the issue of physician-assisted suicide needs to be, um, you know, again, this is something I'm feeling optimistic about. I think there's been a lot of development in the last 10 years on, on this question. Um, it used to be the case that people had to go to, you know, Switzerland um, to the Dignitas clinic, clinic because it was illegal to um, take your life, say, in something like the UK, where I'm from. So, um, but it's a tricky question. You know, to what to what extent um, is physician-assisted suicide? How can that be abused? Yes, of course it can be abused. That could easily become... Uh, that could very, very easily be abused. And there isn't, as it were, a simple rule that you can follow there. But the idea the idea that we have to keep people alive in all circumstances uh, against their wishes strikes me as ridiculous, right? We, we should at least, we should be able to allow people to die with dignity if they choose that. Um, I do we have time for one more question? Uh, oh, one go. more, okay, I think one more question from Megan. I just came in. Uh, she, she asks, What could the rich vocabulary surrounding suicide, uh, different kinds of suicide, uh, possibly include? Uh, yeah. there are different kinds of suicide, right? So she says, Suicide due to the end of personal relationship. So, uh, what could the rich vocabulary surrounding suicide? Well, it would be, I think, there would be a question of you know, different names, right? We have this. This one concept, suicide, self-slaughter, um, and um, you know we need uh, we could imagine a name for uh, impulsive manic suicide. So if someone is say um, psychotic, they will often end up killing themselves. But because they're psychotic that won't be judged to be a suicide that will be accidental death we have that we have you know the um you know as i mentioned before the you know the wound of the uh the lover you know uh revenge that's a very powerful uh very powerful form of suicide but it's different from the previous one 
And then um, there's also, you know, we need a, a way of thinking about suicides, which are really people, people will often plan suicides for long periods of time. Uh, and it's uh, Andrew Solomon says somewhere as if they were organizing a holiday in outer space. Right. Um, and uh, there's that, the kind of rational, but as it were, irrational suicide. And then there's, we need a concept that covers the previous question that someone who is, um, uh, has a, has a physical illness, a terminal illness, and they'd like to end their lives. Um, what do we call that? Assisted dying. That would be a start, but we could think of other concepts as well. And there's also the issue, um, which is that the, uh, which going back to the previous question that the, if somebody, so a, a, autonomy is a really tricky question. On the one hand, it's easy to say, well, the patient's autonomy should be respected. And um, if they choose to die, well, they choose to die. Um, but is that itself a rational thing to do? What about the effects of that on uh, on their children or their grandchildren? Um, might, so that might be, yeah. So, so we need an, a richer vocabulary, maybe a number of different concepts, and uh, that would be a start for for thinking these things through. Right. I really, I really out of time. I think so. So, no more questions. But uh... on this, um, yeah, re, yeah. I mean, it's funny on on religion. Um, it's it's. Uh, it can be, uh, it's complicated, let's just put it that way. I mean, the, the faiths that I'm most familiar with, the, the Abrahamic faiths, there's no consistent view on, on, on suicide. This is only something that emerges in the medieval period and then becomes the basis for the legal frameworks that still frame uh, many countries and that needs to be questioned. So, um, okay. Right. <laughs> I've got, I've got to go. But yeah. it's, it's, thank you very much for having me. Yes, yes. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Critchley, for your profound reflections on the philosophical and political nature of the problem of suicide. And I hope we will have such sessions with you again in the near future. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks a lot. And thank you thank to you. all the participants. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye -bye.